Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them. And I do want to highlight DynamicForces.com real quick. Check out their website. They got great limited edition covers, CGC books, signed books, remarks, amazing content over at DynamicForces.com. And be sure to enter Robbie at your cart and save 10%. And we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week. Swamp Thing, Green Hell, issue number one from DC Black Label. This is the first part of a new miniseries written by Jeff Lemire, with artwork by Doug Mankey, with uh, coloring by David Barron, and lettering by Steve Wands. This book was phenomenal. I absolutely loved it. There's been a lot of great Swamp Thing runs in the past and even in the present, but this was absolutely fantastic and set itself aside from the rest of them with its own unique vision on what it's doing. So story-wise, what it is, is it's kind of post-apocalyptic or right pre-apocalyptic so like the world's gone to crap there's the last vestiges of humanity they're out there struggling to survive you're introduced to these characters instantly i'm compelled by this world and by these characters and their journey through it right and then you've got the green the red and the 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 rot right you get all three of them, they're struggling to survive too. That's the, the essence of plant life, the essence of flesh life, and the essence of decay. And they decide to band together to create a new avatar that's going to finally take care of the problem as to why the world's gone to shit, which is humanity, right? So you got this truly new, monstrous, and horrific vision of Swamp Thing. And then it's got a nice twist at the end that ties it all in together. I loved it. This is Doug Mankey, a veteran in this industry. The artwork is superb. It's detailed, it's complex, it's nuanced when it needs to be, and when it needs to pop, it freaking pops. Truly horrific, great line work, great texture detail there, and amazing coloring throughout, and a great use of the Prestige Plus format. So this is magazine size, but it gives plenty of room for that horrifying oomphiness. Umphiness. Detective Comics 1046 is the Fear State Aftermath. So this is the epilogue to the event Fear State. And we got all these people, all these people, all these heroes of Gotham, and they're kind of reflecting on what's happened and what will happen. And at the same time, setting up the next Batman-centric crossover, which is Shadows of the Bat, which forces this book to go monthly for like the first three months or weekly for the first three months of 2022. So one event right into the next one. This is the briefest of bridges in between them. Basically it involves the building up of Arkham Tower. We get some revelations about the origins of that. Chase Meridian, how she got involved from Batman Forever. But it's all right. The artwork by Dan Moore is cool, but it does feel a little bit rushed. I think he's off of the book as of this issue. It's just sad to see that go. That was the biggest draw of this book for me. So I don't know. I didn't really like it. And if this Shadows of the Bat thing starts getting weak to me early on, I may just have to let it go. Action Comics 1038. I um, really liked this issue. Thought it was solid. Philip Kennedy Johnson is doing a really solid work is doing really solid work with Kal-El right now, with Superman. He's off at War World with his version of the Authority, then he's going to like take the fight to Mongol, free all these people. It doesn't end up that way. This is a little bit of a lull issue. There's a lot of talking. There's a lot of... We're in a moment. This happens in a lot of Superman books. This happens... Uh, it's happened in Philip Kennedy Johnson's Superman work so far, where the story's really cool. It's big, and then it kind of slows up just a little bit and kind of hinders the pace of the overall narrative just a little bit. That kind of threw me off, but Action Comics, still strong. Artwork was great in that. Deathstroke Incorporated, issue number four. Y'all, one of my biggest surprises of the last half of 2021 is how much I love this book. I've never really been the biggest Deathstroke fan, and throwing him, trying to be a hero, in this organization called Trust, which obviously you shouldn't trust. He's teamed up with Black Canary, it just seems like something that wouldn't work for me, but it works. Each issue has got a crackle of kinetic energy, that Howard Porter artwork. I've never seen his work look so freaking dynamic. Like, And I love his JLA run with Grant Morrison, but this is some really interesting stuff. 
I'm digging the dynamic between him and Black Canary. I'm liking the mystery of this trust organization. We get a lot of revelations in this issue, but it's got this great kinetic superhero we pace that's never boring. I have so much fun with it. Deathstroke Inc., number four. I'm loving that book. Joshua Williamson, doing a great job there. Also doing a great job at Robin. Robin, issue number nine. The basic premise of Robin started off simple. Uh, Damian Wayne goes off after the death of Alfred, goes off to join Mortal Kombat, right? But we get introduced to all this new lore and mythology tied into the family of, of Ra's al Ghul and all that kind of jazz. But the tournament bit's over and I'm still completely compelled by this story. This is a big finale and finish, but then a setup as to where this book is going to be going, what it's going to be exploring. And what I love so much about what jo what uh, Joshua Williamson can do with Robin is he's taking the character of Damian Wayne and doing something compelling with it. He's not just two-dimensional. He's not just a one-note joke. He's not just this like spoiled brat little kid that has to prove he's better than everybody else. He's dealing with some real stuff from the depth of Alfred. He's dealing with some real isolation and it's told but still in a very vibrant, fun, boisterous superhero book. Robin, Joshua Williamson's doing a great job over at DC Superheroes right now. Then we got The Flash 777. Uh, Jeremy Adams has been doing a really solid job on Flash. This is a pretty decent issue. It didn't quite hit me as much as some of the previous ones have, but now Wally West is the focus on Flash, so he's off in another dimension with the Justice League Dark, trying to figure out some stuff in Gym World involving Eclipso. Meanwhile, he's got real family stuff going on because he's got his two kids. One of them has powers, the other one doesn't. So it's kind of like half family drama, half Justice League Dark Flash team up, but it kind of works. It's cool. The artwork was solid. Flash has been a very consistently strong book. Task Force Z is here with issue number three. I'm off of this book. Didn't really like issue number one. I kind of dug issue number two. I did not like issue number three. This is the Suicide Squad, but they're zombies, right? So dead supervillains like Bane, like Man Bat, like Deadshot, they are now part of a team led by Jason Todd. He has to give them these Lazarus pills so they maintain some kind of mental acuity. Uh, otherwise, they just turn to mindless zombies and... It's a weird concept, and it's just not working for me. I feel like it's a little bit overwrought, a little melodramatic, and it's like a book like this should be or feel a little bit more fun and goofy, and it's not. And at the same time, I don't want it to be fun and goofy because what are you doing to Deadshot? What are you doing to Bane? Are you turning them into zombie jokes? Come on. I, I don't like that book anymore. I don't think I ever really liked it. DC vs. Vampires, issue number three. This is a book I don't like anymore. I thought issue number one was solid. Issue number two, to me, kind of just retreaded everything from the first issue and I kind of feel like that a little bit again in issue number three okay vampires are trying to take over the DC universe by turning superheroes okay what else has changed a couple superheroes have died okay what else has changed nothing it's just like one note this is a 12 issue series and I'm like when's it really going to kick into gear hasn't really happened yet it's just not doing anything for me it just feels kind of rushed thrown together very loose as far as the story and as far as the artwork goes i usually am a big fan of otto schmidt but you can see a lot of cut corners here just didn't work for me also not working for me is aquaman the becoming and aquaman green uh, arrow deep target both of these written by brandon thomas there was a time y'all if you remember where i lamented the fact that we didn't have a single aquaman book now I'm lamenting the fact that we have three, if you count Black Mana, and I'm not enjoying any of them. And they're all about to converge into one Aquaman book, but at least then it will just be one. But man, these books, they're boring, they're dull, and they're not exciting to me. And I'm only getting them because I'm that guy that gets everything Aquaman, and it's really a struggle right now. Superman 78 is here with issue number five, the penultimate issue. I'm digging this nice retrospective look into the Superman, Richard Donner, Christopher Reeve, uh, era, right? This is basically the Superman 3 that we should have gotten with Brainiac. So it's big. It's a cliche, typical story that we've seen done over and over. But if we would have seen this done cinematically in the 80s, you could see how it would really have some pop and even some emotional weight to it if you actually had Marlon Brando and Christopher Reeve in it doing it back then. That being said, you do got a little bit of a cameo here by Richard Pryor, which I thought was cool. But Superman 78, issue number five, solid enough. Hasn't quite lived up to its promise established in issue number one, but it's been an enjoyable series for me. Then the Human Target, issue number three. I'm just not digging it. I really love the artwork by Greg Smallwood, but the story, Human Target is trying to protect Lex Luthor in the first issue. Lex Luthor, someone's trying to poison him. Turns out the Human Target gets the poison. 
The poison's going to kill him in 12 days. So he has 12 days to solve the case. 12 days, 12 issues. Each issue is a day. Now that we know that, I feel like Tom King is just wasting time, wasting some space. This is very cliche, detective 40s film noir type, hard-boiled type style of writing. But there's nothing novel or interesting about it aside from it's involving Guy Gardner and Ice and Booster Gold. And so for me, it's just not working. It's a mystery that feels like it's going to be stretched thin. I love the artwork, but I'm just, the story is a little bit trite. It's a little cliche. And there's nothing novel about it aside from just Justice League International, which isn't enough for me. Then we've got Marvel. So let's talk about Timeless. Timeless is a one-shot comic book. It's $5.99, extra size, all written by Jed McKay. It's got artwork by Kev Walker, Mark Bagley, and Greg Land. It's a Kang one-and-done story that allegedly promises to give us clues and hints at what's to come in Marvel in 2022. And it does drop some of those hints. It's basically just a self-contained Kang story. That's interesting. Basically, Kang comes across a book that this dude wrote in which the guy says, Dr. Doom was the greatest supervillain of humanity, right? And Kang takes the dude. He's like, you're going to roll with me for a while. You're going to do a, a ride along. And I'm going to prove to you that it's me. Weird stretch, but it actually works in the book and it's actually kind of cool and it's kind of fun. And the mystery, the way it, it kind of resolves itself at the end is interesting. But there is some timey-wimey stuff going on. And during certain bits, you do get glimpses of things going on now or going on in the near future or the possible near future. So you're like, there's a double page spread where you're like, oh, that's that's referencing Spider-Man. That's referencing Eternals. That's referencing X-Men. That's ref So you get a little bit of hints like that, but... Nothing super big, but then Marvel would lead you to believe that there's something super big revealed here at the end that's going to make a lot of people go, what? It's going to make a lot of people go, what's that mean? And then people like me going, really? Yeah, right. We'll see. We'll see how that works out. Anyway, Timeless is a one shot. Is it necessary? I would say no. But it's a cool, solid, one and done Kang story. It was all right. Then we got Devil's Reign, issue number two. I criticized first issue for being too much like Civil War, and it still kind of is. It's literally hitting some of the same notes. So the whole idea is this. Kingpin's been the mayor of New York City for a while. He's up for re-election. And before that, he banned superheroes in New York. So all these superheroes, aside from Daredevil, because he cared, aside from Daredevil, it seemed like nobody cared that Kingpin was the mayor of New York, right? But now that they're banned, all of a sudden they care, and it's a big deal, and Captain America has to choose a side, and he chooses the side of... You know, the non-government force, right? Which, oh, they did that in Civil War. Then there's this moment, really original, where they show up to Luke Cage's house and they're like, you better calm down, man. He's like, I ain't doing nothing, bro. And they have to take, wait a second. They did that in Civil War too. Anyway, that's what I'm saying. It's kind of retreading the same stuff. But at least in issue number two, it kind of starts doing some interesting things on their own. You get a little bit more explanation on some mystery about why Elektra's doing what she's doing. You get a little bit of, really cool stuff about what Kingpin is doing. Like the next phase of his plan, it involves his cane. Really interesting, cool stuff there. Great artwork from Marco Cicchetto. This would be really good if it was just Daredevil, but it doesn't feel earned as an event, but it feels earned as the buildup to what Sadarsky and Cicchetto have been doing on Daredevil. So Devil's Reign number two, I liked it. It was decent. It's pretty solid. Then we got Wastelanders Star-Lord issue number one. This is a one-shot comic book set in that Wastelanders podcast audio drama world uh, which is set in the old man logan world so this is dealing with star lord i never read all of old man quill but this one's written by rich duick who was the writer of road of bones the wailing blade sea of sorrows big fan of his work plus he's a friend of the show we had an interview with him earlier this year check it out if you missed it um, but this is a nice solid one-shot comic book about old man quill in this world dealing with some regrets dealing with a lot of a lot of emotion and trauma, right? And so there's, it's really heavy on that at first, and then it kicks into some gear. I really liked the book. I thought it was a nice self-contained story. If you're just looking for something simple and quick uh, to read that's got some action, it's got some nuance, and actually just works with the character, Wastelander Star-Lord number one was pretty solid. Then we've got Death of Doctor Strange, issue number four, the penultimate issue. Um, it's losing its momentum. It's losing steam. I really was into the first and second issue. Now that we know that this is just all a bridge and a setup to a new book called Strange by Jed McKay in which Clea is going to be the Sorcerer Supreme. It just feels like it's not got the weight that it should. The reveal of who's responsible for the death of Doctor Strange is here. And I'm just like, that, okay. That, that. And maybe there's something more. There is one more issue. Artwork's solid. The story is solid. But it's just not quite living up 
to the promise of the first couple of issues for me. Then we got Image Comics, we got Stray Dogs, Dog Days, issue number one. This is the first of two issues in this miniseries. It's a prequel to the Stray Dogs miniseries. So what it is is tiny little vignettes giving you a little bit of the origin story of some of the puppies, some of the dogs that were part of that Stray Dog story. And they're really cool. Some of them are just nice and cute and charming. Others are kind of like, ooh, that's messed up. Others are really gut-wrenching. The one with the cat really got me. So you got Tony Fleece, you got Trish Forstner, you got the whole team here. It's nice to dive back into this world. It would be cool to see something new, like a new yarn being spun. But we're going back. We're getting a little bit of, of interesting stories about these animals and their owners uh, or I should say they're humans beforehand. Really liked it, thought it was super cool, and yet another chance to get a great horror movie poster homage cover, this one being Creep Show. Gotta love it for that. Then you got Ice Cream Man, issue 27. This is a wild issue of Ice Cream Man. What is, is that a Kafka book? Metamorphosis or whatever, where the dude turns into a cockroach? This is the opposite of that. It's a cockroach turning into a dude. And if you think the idea of you turning into a cockroach would be truly horrifying. Imagine what it would be like to be a cockroach and turn human and all of a sudden you got couples counseling and you got to meet quotas at work and, and you're dealing with this ex existential crisis of humanity. Like, it was a really interesting spin on that idea. I really like it. Uh, w. Maxwell Prince, uh, Martin Martin Marazzo, Chris O'Halloran, this is one of the best books on the shelves. If you've never read it, you could pick this one up. They're all self-contained. They're all one and done. They're all weird. They're all quirky, but they all say something about the human experience. This one is disturbing and quirky. At first, I was like, is this going to be about the lives of cockroaches? Then you see where it develops. <clears throat> Another fantastic issue of Ice Cream Man. That was almost pick of the week worthy. Then we got Echo Lands, issue number five. Amazing artwork. The way the story is told. The way that it's bound panoramically like this. It is a treasure to the eyes, to the senses there. Amazing lettering by Todd Klein. Amazing coloring by Dave Stewart. The story, though, it's got some interesting moments. It's got some interesting concepts. But overall, the story is not compelling at all. Not like the artwork. Not like even the lettering, the design of the book. Everything about this book shines. The execution of the story is just okay. So that could be a lot better. This would be one of the best comics ever, probably. And maybe... Maybe the world can't handle the best of everything. But anyway, Echo Lands number five, still enjoyable. But it is, there are good concepts, but everything else is the star of that one, right? Then we got Sweet Paprika issue number six. Originally, some shops got this last week. We got it, but we were told to hold off on it, so we did. But Sweet Paprika number six, Mirka and Dolpho, I love this book. It's a charming a uh, book about sexual repression. It's about this woman. She's a big wig at a publishing firm. She's been repressed sexually her entire life. Turns out that her dad, who's, who was responsible for that basically, is a huge hypocrite. Now she's trying to explore her sexuality. She's trying to do it in a very bossy kind of way with like a, a male boy or whatever. They're all demons or angels. Why? Who knows? It doesn't matter. I really like this book. It's got a charm to it. It's got a wit. It's got some class. But it's still a little bit naughty. I like it. Sweet Paprika issue number six. We're halfway through. That's a 12-issue series. Then we have Apache Delivery Service issue number one from Dark Horse Comics. This is written by Matt Kent with artwork by Tyler Jenkins and Hillary Jenkins there on the coloring. Really like this book. It's a Vietnam War story about a Native American soldier. He's kind of ostracized from, from the other soldiers because they call him the Apache, even though he's not Apache. He's Native American, but that's not his tribe. He is the spotter for like where they drop the bombs or something. So they always call that the Apache delivery service. He is off on his own in the jungle one day and he comes across this dude who gives him a proposition, something. It's really interesting. It had a really cool hook at the end. The artwork is gritty. It's got a loose texture to it, but it really works for the vibe and feel of this story. I thought this was very well done. Apache Delivery Service, issue number one. That's from Dark Horse. We also have the Sword of Hyperborea. Um, this one was all right. I was kind of lost and confused. It's from the world of Hellboy. His name was, they said. But this is focusing on a newer character, I think, in the BPRD, which I haven't read up to that point. And, a, and another character um, from uh, the, the Witchfinder. It's a character that has a sword, and this is the story of the sword through the years. But it didn't feel very accessible. I felt kind of lost. The artwork was really cool in it, but I'm going to have to get caught up and, and get a sense of of what this sword is and its importance and its and its history before I can dive into something like this, which is more like 
kind of like expanded universe type stuff. You can call it that. May's book is here with issue number five. This is the final issue of the Jeff Lemire classic. This is one of the best books of the year. This was a fantastic ending to this book. It's about a guy whose daughter died of cancer. And since then, his life's kind of really spiraled out of control. He's been just living in a pit of hopelessness and despair. And one day he gets a phone call. He thinks he hears his daughter's voice. He becomes like obsessed with these mazes that she used to do. He's convinced that one of them is connected to the city and he's trying to find his missing daughter. And what we get to here at the end, what he actually finds, what he actually discovers, the way it unfolds the story, really nuanced, incredibly well done, a very emotional ending, a very strong ending, very solid. This is one of the best books of the year. This was a fantastic ending. Jeff Lemire does it again, giving us really well-crafted, rooted in emotion stories that seem depressing, but by the end of it, it's it's about that whole experience, right? Then we got Power Rangers Universe issue number one. First of all, foil highlights on that cover. You got me right there. Power Ranger book foil. I was so lost and damn confused. None of this I recognize from Mighty Morphin. There may be some elements from other Power Ranger series that I never really quite invested into, but I was so lost. This is the first part of a six issue series that I think I just might want to skip because I mean, the foil cover is cool and I'm loving the Power Ranger books, but what the hell was that? I was so freaking lost. Like I just couldn't get into it. But then we had Power Rangers 14. I could get into this one. What Ryan Parrott's doing on Power Rangers and Mighty Morphin right now is crafting one of the best superhero books on shelves right now. We've been exploring the origins of, of Zordon and Lord Zed and their people and all this kind of stuff and and the, the beginnings of that rivalry and of his villainy and now it's erupted into this Eltarian war. All these pieces are moving around. It's highly charged, super kinetic. It's explosive. It's boisterous in action. I'm loving this book, man. And I don't even think you have to be a hardcore Power Ranger fans to really appreciate and enjoy this. But you do have to have been down from day one, pretty much, because it's one big story that they're telling. That's really cool. Then we got Once in Future here with issue number 23. By the way, Grandma from Once in Future makes a little cameo in Detective Comics. So I spy. So I just wanted to point that out. Once in Future, though, a really great book. Karen Gillan can take elements from British and English legend and Arthurian lore and mythology and, and like twist it and do something interesting with it. Do some inverting, do some subverting of your expectations and delivering a really cool, fantastical story that's in the vein of something like Indiana Jones, but a lot more supernatural, a lot more intelligent. And I'm not saying Indiana Jones is dumb. It's not. But I'm just saying there's something a little bit more studious about this one but i really like it once in future issue 23 amazing artwork from dan mora brilliant coloring by tamra bond villain you get all these different avatars of these these characters like lancelot and galahad and arthur and merlin and all these pieces moving around it feels like we've kind of been stuck in place for the last few issues but we do we are putting p pieces in place for something about to explode. I'm really excited. Once in Future has been super solid. Then Human Remains, issue number four from Vault Comics, Peter Milligan, Sally Cantrino, Deborah Kelly, and And World Design. This book is okay. I really love the first couple of issues. And one of the criticisms early on was, man, it's hard to even see that because of the background there in it. Um, one of the criticisms early on, which I disagreed with at the time, was that we didn't have a human thread to pull us through. A really interesting concept, kind of like a quiet place, but with emotions. If you're feeling vibrant emotions, these monsters show up and just snatch your ass up, just eat you up, gobble you up, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff, right? And what Peter Milligan is doing with the themes and how that context works with the story is really cool. But we don't have a human connection that drives us all the way through. It's causing these last couple issues to be a little disappointing, still cool, still exploring some interesting territory, but not necessarily doing much to live up to what was established in the first two. So moving those themes across, but not really having a human connection for such a story about human nature. Anyway, Human Remains number four, I'm digging it, just slightly bummed out by the pace of the last couple of issues. Anyway, that's what I read, that's what I thought. What are you reading? What are you digging? Let us know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for checking out the video. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And join us over at popculturephilosophers.com for podcast blogs and a whole lot more. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading. Station.